back. What a difference a year makes. Super Bowl 54, a packed stadium in Miami. J-Lo, Shakira's sizzling halftime performance, right? How can we all forget that? Wait, it's very difficult to forget, but now this Sunday, Super Bowl 55, the Bucks face the Chiefs in Tampa Bay in a stadium with far fewer fans, obviously due to COVID. And given everything we've been through this past year, the pandemic, protests, a volatile presidential election, this Sunday's game takes on a whole new meeting for many different reasons. So joining us this morning is sports journalist Jamel Hill to offer some insight on uh, and really weigh in on this year's big game. Jamel, so good to see you. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate being here. Absolutely. And let me know if I get to weigh in on the pizza debate. Oh, oh yeah, we want to <laughs> know. Right. That's we'll right. save that for last. In the meantime, though, okay. there's, there's a lot riding on this weekend's game, right, for both teams and their quarterbacks. How do you see this playing out? Well, I mean, it, this is uh, kind of a historic matchup because you have Tom Brady, who's played in 511 Super Bowls, and Patrick Mahomes, who's the defending uh, Super Bowl champion, and, you know, kind of the new generation versus the old mm -hmm. generation. And so uh, I think, you know, this is going to be a really good game. Um, certainly for Tom Brady, his career is already cemented, already proven. Uh, but I think if you're Patrick Mahomes and you're able to get – a Super Bowl victory over Tom Brady, mm -hmm. uh, that just adds that much more to your resume. Oh, yeah. I do want to add that there was once upon a time my Giants did defeat uh, <laughs> Tom Brady. So he is a mortal. I just want to make sure we put that on the record. But, Jamel, you know, speaking of, of, of quarterbacks, one of the most famous quarterbacks is Colin Kaepernick, a friend of yours, a partner of yours. Uh, the new docuseries on his life and activism premieres this weekend, Colin Kaepernick versus the World. You're also working together on another project. Which brings us to the big question, you know, he really brought light to something that gave birth in some ways to the Black Lives Movement. Uh, we have not seen Colin Kaepernick play since he took a knee during the singing of the national anthem, August 26, 2016, and here we are. So what do you think now of the state of race and sports now and moving forward? Well, um, I guess Colin Kaepernick was uh, too many years ahead of his time because now everybody wants to have a conversation about race, sports, and social injustice. And he was having this conversation and trying to get America to have this conversation long before the events of 2020. Um, you know, it's going to still be the NFL's great shame. I mean, the reality is that the NFL has done a lot of lip service and talking about how they support Black Lives Matter movement, the, the movement, and Roger Goodell even going so far as to apologize to Colin Kaepernick. Mm -hmm. But guess what hasn't changed? He's still blackballed from the NFL. And until they make that right, and I don't think that they ever will, all of their gestures, all of their efforts to try to um, act as if they're allies in this movement, to me, will always seem disingenuous because the biggest opportunity you had was to make sure that Colin Kaepernick didn't have his career destroyed mm -hmm. and we see what happened. So no matter what they do, no matter what they say, to me, this is going to always be a black mark for the NFL. Yeah, I want to hone in on that because over the summer, and you mentioned this, Roger Goodell did apologize to Colin Kaepernick uh, for the NFL and the way it handled the whole national anthem protest. But what is the league doing to embrace Black Lives Matter in this whole movement? And who is holding these teams accountable? Well, if you look by their track record, they're doing nothing. I mean, we uh, have three black head coaches in the NFL, and while there are more GMs, I believe there, there may be five black GMs, we're talking about a league that is 70% black, no majority black owner. Um, you know, there's never been a, a NFL owner that's been black. So there's a lot that the league needs to correct in its own, um, you know, in, inside of its, its own organization. And they want to be considered to be some kind of mouthpiece when it comes to social justice. Well, you can't be that mouthpiece if you can't fix what's happening in your own league. Now, I realize this is not just about Roger Goodell. He's the face of the league in mm -hmm. many ways. This is about NFL owners who have shown through their actions that they don't have faith, confidence, trust, and believe in black leadership. And so until they rectify that problem, much like with the Colin Kaepernick situation, it's hard for me to take them seriously when it comes to social justice or believing that they really care about the Black Lives Matter movement. It seems the only thing that changed with the NFL 
is that the public's opinion of the mm. Black Lives Matter movement changed, thus making it more comfortable mm -hmm. for them to begin to associate with this movement. I don't look at what you do when it's convenient. I look at what you do when it's not convenient. And the NFL already showed who they are when it's not convenient for them to be uh, speaking up about these issues. And, and to that point, you know, Colin Kaepernick was obviously still an active player when he started kneeling, which sparked this whole movement. And I think about one of the three black uh, coaches that you talk about, Brian Flores of the Miami Dolphins. I know that he was very active, but he is only one voice. I wonder if you think it is the responsibility of active players or, or people who are on the field, who, who are part of operations, to sort of carry that mantle as part of the active NFL to speak out in the same kind of way that Colin did? Or is it for the well, people on the sidelines to look? No, I, I think what we're looking at is traditionally what's been the case. And especially in the black community, uh, black athletes have a long tradition of speaking out uh, and sacrificing for these issues. And so I think there is a responsibility that some players and coaches feel to carry on that tradition. Now, it's certainly not something that's meant for everybody. But I think that we all look to, in many ways, those who have uh, a platform, those who can gain the attention of people in a different way uh, to use themselves uh, when it comes to speaking up about black issues and racism and, and white supremacy. And mm. so uh, I think it's important that that continue to carry on. However, my fear is that because of what happened to Colin Kaepernick, that players and coaches will feel as if they shouldn't do these mm. things because they see the glowing example is that there's no reward in it right. and that mm. it could cost you your career. So that is among many reasons why Colin Kaepernick needs to have a job in the NFL because you don't want to send the message that those who speak out on the right side of history will somehow be penalized for doing that. Well, and, you're, and just to know, mm -hmm. Colin is only 33 years old. Mm -hmm. Tom Brady is going to play in this Super Bowl, and he's 43. So mm -hmm. Colin has a lot of, of road ahead right. of him in terms of, of his athletic prowess. But go, go ahead. Go ahead yeah, Katie. I just wanted to button that up because, uh, you, you know, you're walking the walk, Jamel. Uh, you have a whole lot on your plate. I mean, you're what you're producing right now, contributing to a writer to The Atlantic. You have a popular podcast, Unbothered. Your show on Vice um, won't stick to sports. Do you feel vindicated after everything that happened that went down in 2018 you know vindication is an interesting word um you know i, I didn't want to be right about the president <laughs> okay i didn't i didn't want to be right about what i said about him uh because i live in this country too and i didn't want to be governed by somebody like that and so um you know there was a lot of racial conversation even beyond the president just in sports and I know that now there seems to be a lot of networks, a lot of different um, sports entities that seem to be far more comfortable in discussing these issues. Mm -hmm. I hope that it's a good reminder to the people who were once hesitant to talk about sports and race or sports and gender uh, that you can't capitulate to the people who are screaming, and especially when they're being intellectually dishonest. Mm. Sports has always mashed up against these messy issues throughout the history of sports. So to pretend as if, you know, we're living in a different universe in which sports is happening is just kind of disingenuous. I mean, I find that people don't really mind when we talk about sports and politics and race and gender. What they mind is the opinions being expressed. Mm -hmm. If they disagree with what's being said, then you hear stick to sports. But when everybody's on board, it's funny how you don't hear that as mm -hmm. much. So I think that we just need to keep having these tough conversations. And sports gives us an opportunity to have them in a different way. If you think about it, we don't do a whole lot of things in this country together. Sports right. is one of the few things that we do together, which is why it presents the opportunity for us yeah. to have a different kind of conversation. It's a springboard for sure. Mm. Jamel Hill, always just great speaking with you. Thank you for spending some time with us and, 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 and you know, providing some insight into an issue that a lot of people want to talk about, a lot of them are afraid to talk about, but then some of them are really seeing, you know, the ramifications of talking about it. We appreciate your time. Real quick, what's your favorite pizza and who yeah. are you rooting for on Sunday? Okay, so I got to be honest, I lived in Connecticut. I know. My time at ESPN. Uh -oh. I know. Been to New York a million times. Connecticut has better oh, pizza. Oh, she went with Connecticut. Oh, they have, they have Mamita, pizza, right? thank you. Wait, which place? Yes. Which place? Oh, um, so Pepe's is, is really good, but there's a thousand other places in Connecticut. You can just stumble upon good pizza this anywhere. Is what I'm and I'm sorry, in New York, I think you have to go hunting a little bit because mm -hmm. the market is so saturated. In Connecticut, the quality is out. there mm -hmm. and everywhere. This is exactly. What I'm so, and 
I predict Tampa Bay will win this Super Bowl. So oh, okay, really? All right. I'm going with the best. I heard it here. Okay. Thank you so much. Right. Now, come back soon. Thank Good to talk to you. <laughs>